Uh, well, good, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the RSA. My name is Joshua Rosenberg. I've been invited to chair the event uh, here tonight. I think it started out as a book launch, and it's developed into what I think will be a very timely and very interesting and very well-informed discussion about uh, topical matters, what's happening at the moment, problems facing the criminal justice system here in England and Wales. Um, the entire event is being live-streamed and recorded for the benefit of those who haven't been lucky enough to get a ticket to be here at the RSA tonight. Feel free to tweet using the hashtag RSA Justice. Um, but please keep your phones on silent. We finish at 7.15, so we've got just over an hour. I'm going to introduce our expert panel in just a few minutes, but I suspect that most of you would like to begin by hearing from the author of this book, The Secret Barrister, Stories of the Law and How It's Broken. It really is a very good book indeed. I was at a lecture in Jerusalem last night, uh, given by the Master of the Rolls. I bumped into David Panic, QC, an old friend of mine, uh, and he said how very much he admired this book. Um, and uh, David Panic has been a blogger since before the days that computers were invented, so it's uh, pretty impressive praise from him. Now, as you know, um, this book is written by somebody called The Secret Barrister, or SB for short. Um, I am one of the uh, few people who has knowingly spoken to secret barrister SB because I interviewed SB on the telephone from an undisclosed uh, location uh, for my radio program, Law in Action. Um, you may have heard that, but you won't have heard SB's voice uh, because SB's vo words were read by an actor. And it's an actor's voice that you're about to hear. It's actually um, the actor who reads from the audiobook version of this book. Uh, and you're going to hear um, SB's words read by an actor in a presentation which you're going to see on the screen in a moment. You won't see SB. I'm assured that SB is not in the room. Um, but SB is watching us. Hello, SB. Um, SB is following the live stream. And... Um, just to um, uh, check it works, um, I'm going to put the first question to SB. SB doesn't have to answer immediately. SB will answer um, after the video, the presentation has been shown. SB doesn't know that this is what we're going to do, but I'm telling you, SB, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have to answer um, the, the question. Um, SB's answers will come up on the large screen on Twitter. SB will be tweeting from this secret location. Um, all you'll see on the large screen will be SB's tweets. Of course, you're very welcome to tweet, um, and, and uh, you've got the, uh, the Wi-Fi and the password and the hashtag, so feel uh, Twitter away, as somebody once said. Um, but uh, what you'll see here is SB's answers. Right, okay, SB, here is your question. You'll start for 10. We know you are a barrister. We know you're a practicing barrister. We know you're a barrister of about 10 years call. Um, but the people you deal with every day, other barristers, solicitors, the police, and above all your clients, they don't know that you're making a mental note of what they say and using their stories on your blog, uh, on Twitter, and of course, finally, in this book, maybe in anonymized form, I don't know. Uh, certainly, there are no names of real people. I don't know to what extent you know, you've, you've, you've had to change the, the, the material. But the question really is, um, isn't this a breach of confidence? Uh, uh, what is your justification for working undercover? Because that's something that I can't do. Right, SB, you've got about 10 minutes to think of the answer to that question. And in those 10 minutes, we are going to watch, it's not actually a film, it's actually a PowerPoint presentation uh, with an extract, as I say, from SB's book. Whether learned from first-hand experience or absorbed from pop culture, we all share a conception of criminal justice that we have come to accept as representing the way things are done and the way things should be done. It's culturally embedded, like apologizing when someone else bumps into you or avoiding eye contact in a lift. For some of us, if my non-lawyer friends are a reliable barometer, 
This mental portrait of English criminal justice fuses Judge Judy unholily with that scene from A Few Good Men. Others fall back on the homegrown motifs of Rumpole, Kavanagh QC, or Lord help us all rise for Julian Clary. But whatever variants we visualise, we probably all agree on the basics. An adversarial battle, adversarialism being a loose term for the model pitting the state against the accused in a lawyer-driven skirmish for victory played out before an impartial body of assessors, comprising a courtroom, judge, jury, accused, lawyers, witnesses, questions and speeches in some sort of configuration, and plenty of wigs. That, for most people though, is possibly where contemplations on criminal justice end. I imagine few of us devote much, if any, time to thinking critically about our criminal justice system, to considering how and why we have this particular way of doing justice, or reflecting on the impact it has upon the hundreds of thousands of people, defendants, witnesses and victims, who pass through the system every year. Not in the way that most of us form and gladly share opinions on the way we administer or fund healthcare, say, or the merits or demerits of types of schools. And this I find odd, because criminal justice affects us all. We are yet to find a society that does not have rules surrounding the behaviour of its members and sanctions for their transgression. Agreeing social imperatives and taboos and enforcing them through shunning appears to be instinctual behaviour in cooperative primates, and the notion of a codified criminal law can be traced back to Bronze Age Mesopotamia and the Code of Ur-Namu in 2050 BC. The precise rules have since differed across time and geography, but a mechanism for administering criminal justice always exists. To commit a crime is to break a law that offends not just those directly affected, but strikes at the heart of our communal values so deeply that we agree that organised coercive action is required to mark the affront. Crimes are marked as the gravest breaches of our social codes, which, unlike civil wrongs such as breach of contract, the state cannot leave to individuals to privately arbitrate. The criminal law establishes the boundaries of our humanity by identifying the no-go zones and endowing the state with unique powers of correction intended to punish, deter, protect and rehabilitate. Crimes are the legal disputes that provoke primeval, visceral reactions in people with no stake in the fight, intruding through screens and leaping off pages and into our core identity, pinching and testing the standards by which we define ourselves. If crimes are permitted to occur unaddressed or are attributed to the wrong person, the harm extends beyond those directly involved. It means that our streets are less safe, our values are undermined, and our personal liberty is at risk. A fundamental term of our social contract is that the rules are enforced fairly against us all. A breach of this term offends our innate sense of fairness like little else. And it is not merely theoretical. While we may not wish to think about it, for most of us the impact of criminal justice will someday be immediate and all too tangible. It is certain that at one point in your life you or someone you love will be in a criminal courtroom, whether it is as a juror, a victim of crime, a witness, or locked behind that perspex screen at the back of court, screaming your innocence and flanked by bruising security guards dragging you down to the cells. I can understand why people might only think of criminal justice in the abstract. Without first-hand experience of the system, it is easy to not give its impenetrable workings much of a second thought. But that first direct contact changes everything. At this point, it is brought home, vividly and viscerally, what criminal justice means in practice. Not abstract concepts in dusty textbooks, but a suffusion of humanity, tears, blood, anger, loss, redemption and despair. Dispensing criminal justice means changing lives forever. The trial process and court's judgment can tear a life apart. Families can be broken, children separated from their parents and people locked up for decades. A miscarriage of justice can leave the aggrieved confined, metaphorically or literally, in a prison from which there appears to be no escape. 
While in the UK, the state no longer has the power to kill at the end of a criminal trial, functioning justice can still ultimately be a matter of life and death. Furthermore, until that first contact, you may take for granted that, much like other inscrutable fundamentals of our society, such as intelligence gathering, refuse collection or library cataloguing, when required, the system will broadly, allowing for the margin of error common to all state-delivered services, work as it should, and that the right outcome will be delivered in the end. This entirely understandable complacency is, for many people I meet, what makes that first immersion in the criminal justice system so shocking, as they realize not only how strongly they disagree with the way in which our society prioritizes and dispenses justice, but how, quivering outside the courtroom door, it is now too late to do anything about it. When you have sat in as many decrepit court cells or tired coffee-stained witness suites as I have, looking into the eyes of someone whose most basic sense of what is fair and what is right has been entirely crushed by their exposure to the criminal justice system, you can either slink into jaundiced defeatism or you can sound an alarm. This is what I want to talk about, to explore why criminal justice matters and to show how I think we are getting it so wrong. If criminals avoid justice, the loss is not only felt by the victim. The danger created by harmful behaviours going uncorrected presents a significant threat to the individual liberty of us all. If there are too many wrongful convictions, or too few criminals getting their just deserts, the delicate social contract bonding us all to each other and to the state can swiftly disintegrate. Simply put, if enough people don't believe the state to be capable of dispensing justice, they may start to dispense it themselves. It is for these reasons that it is not hyperbolic, I honestly believe, to suggest that working criminal justice and our role prosecuting and defending criminal allegations is essential to peaceable democratic society. It is when people feel that justice is denied that they are at their most indignant and rage-filled. It is in the gaps between justice that anti-democratic, subversive urges can take root. This is why I consider what I do on a day-to-day -day basis to be not just a privilege, but a civic responsibility. And it is for the same reasons that the current state of our criminal justice system should terrify us. Because despite the noble principles underpinning the system, despite its international prestige, its intellectual craftsmanship and the very real blood, sweat and tears spilt in its ponderous cultivation, my still tender years exposed to the grim reality have taught me that the criminal justice system is close to breaking point. Access to justice, the rule of law, fairness to defendants, justice for victims, these fine emblems which we purport to hold so dear are each day incarnated in effigy, rolled out in the Crown and Magistrates' courts and ritually torched. Serious criminal cases collapse on a daily basis because of eminently avoidable failings by underfunded and understaffed police and prosecution services. The accused and the alleged victim can wait years for a trial, told their cases are adjourned for lack of court time for a second, third or fourth time, notwithstanding the brand new courtroom built at significant public expense sitting empty down the corridor due to slashed court budgets. The wrongly accused wait until the day of trial, or perhaps for eternity, for the state to disclose material that fatally undermines the prosecution case. Defendants can find themselves represented by exhausted lawyers able to devote only a fraction of the required time to their case, due to the need to stack cheap cases high to absorb government cuts. Some defendants are excluded from publicly funded representation altogether, forced to scrape together savings or loans to meet legal aid contributions or private legal fees failing which they represent themselves in DIY proceedings in which the end game is a prison sentence. The bottom line is that victims of crime are denied justice and people who are not guilty find themselves in prison. 
a working criminal justice system, properly resourced and staffed by dedicated professionals, each performing their invaluable civic functions for the prosecution and the defense, serves to protect the innocent, protect the public, and protect the integrity, decency, and humanity of our society. This should be a societal baseline, not a luxury. Most of you listening to this will never expect to be plunged into a criminal courtroom, never expect to hear the constabulary knock on the front door, never expect to be a victim of crime, never expect to be accused of a crime you didn't commit. But the one thing I have learned about criminal justice is that it doesn't discriminate. Anyone can be reeled in. And if you are, whether you're giving evidence against the man who hurt your child or swearing blind to a jury that that pedestrian stepped out in front of your car without looking, you want the system to work. When it doesn't, the consequences can be unthinkable. Powerful stuff, isn't it? Very, very impressive uh, writing. Uh, very, it's not just a whinge, it's just not, it's not just, you know, everything's dreadful, but it's, it's a very thoughtful approach towards this. Okay, now we're going to start, I think, um, with um, uh, uh, Secret Barrister's responses. Um, he, uh, he's reporting that I'm assuring, he or she is reporting that I'm assuring uh, the audience that uh, SB is not in the room. Um, and, um, okay, this is exciting, right? Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, let's scroll down the page in order to see whether we've got um, the response to my questions from Secret Barrister, or perhaps to scroll up the page, but I don't see any actual responses to my questions. So while we're trying to sort that out, um, let me turn to Angela Rafferty, who is chair of the Criminal Bar Association. Um, Angela, um, I suppose SB might be one of your members. Um, do you have any problems with the concept of an undercover barrister? any question that this author is seeking personal glory for this. Um, barristers who write in their own capacity can often be said to potentially be seeking that. This is a rational light being shown on something that is very important to all of us and this author tells the truth. Okay, um, next to you is Nazir Afzal, OBE, former Chief Crown Prosecutor for North West England. Um, the CPS wouldn't like a, a secret prosecutor in the ranks, would they? Um, probably not. Um, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm here and they aren't, I suppose. Um, I mean, the other point uh, that Angela, I think, alluded to was that um, there would be consequences, potentially, if you spoke out, particularly if you spoke out um, as a, a prosecutor or a chief prosecutor. I mean, there have been some that have been um, anonymized on Twitter or whatever it is, but. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of steps taken to try and identify who they are. And, and that goes back to the point about shooting the messenger rather than uh, dealing with the message. Okay. And so I'm very encouraged that uh, he's done what he or she has done, what they have done. Okay. Well, look, we've got the responses. You can see them here, but I'll just read a few. SB says, it's critical that those of us who are able to speak out, whether anonymously or otherwise, do so. There are vulnerable people who depend on us. When I criticise elements of the system such as the Minister of Justice or the resourcing of the CPS, I would plead a strong public interest defence to any suggestions I should keep quiet about obvious failings in how we do justice. As for whether what I do amounts to a breach of confidentiality, I don't believe it does. Being careful to disguise the details of cases coupled with my anonymity preserves the privacy of the lay clients. Finally, and importantly, it allows me to carry on doing a job which I do and as I, say, as I read that out, the words, um, the words move off the screen. But I think you've got the general idea. Um, OK, let me introduce Jonathan Black, Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year in 2015, a solicitor advocate who appears in the Crown Court and, and the Court of Appeal. I suppose you might have, you might have met SB in court at some point in, in the past. You wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I suspect he doesn't, we don't share the same patch, though. Um, oh, oh, you're trying to track down SB. Well, we won't, we won't, go, we won't go there. But, but, I mean, what, what do you think of that response, that SB is, is fully entitled to report what SB sees and hears, and, and that it's right to speak out and everybody should do that? 
it has to be said, it has to be done. The only, the only way in which he could have done it uh, without anonymity would be had he left the profession, had he gone into your, your trade, for example, Joshua. Yeah. Um, it's a, a similar parallel has been seen in the National Health Service with, I think it's Adam Kay has produced a similar expose on, on the National Health with his, with his uh, book, um, It Will Hurt, I think it's called. Secret Barrister, unfortunately, he's still only 10 years cool and has to uh, continue with his profession for a number of years. Uh, undercover, but what he's doing, the job he's doing is a very important job. It's getting criminal justice into the newspapers, onto the front page, continuing the momentum which started at the beginning of the year with Liam Allen, continues with the, um, with the news with the Criminal Bar Association. He's keeping that. Yeah. Are you, you're fluid. referring to the disclosure failures of the Crown yes. Prosecution Service. Okay, finally, Penelope Gibbs, um, former lay magistrate, former BBC producer, a radio producer, but you set up the campaign group Transform Justice. Now, you're a researcher. Your research is open, it can be checked, but nobody can check what SB is asserting. Uh, I think SB is great, and I actually think it would be good. That, can I just say, there are bloggers who are also brilliant, in, uh, who are lawyers, who are open, like Matthew Scott. So it's a choice, but equally, I can see why the secret barrister, who is still currently practicing, keeps anonymous. And the acid test is, is it real? Does it feel real to barristers out there? And I would say, I think we need more bloggers like that. So I don't know if anybody remembers, there used to be a blog called The Magistrate's Blog. Mm, yeah. And it was absolutely brilliant, actually. And that magistrate could never do it uh, openly. But, and you might not agree with some of the things he said, and it was definitely a he, but it really shone a light on what it was like to be a magistrate. SB clearly mainly works in the Crown Court. We've got less of a light of what's going on in the magistrate's courts. Can we not have the secret prob probation officer, please? The secret prison officer? We need to shine a light on what's actually going on, particularly from people who for various reasons, can't do it openly. Yes. I mean, the person who, who, and it was a person who wrote the magistrate's blog, um, got into trouble um, with the uh, authorities. Uh, and um, the way he resolved it is he subtly changed the title of the magistrate's blog. It used to be magistrate's um, apostrophe S, as in a single magistrate, and he changed it to magistrate's S apostrophe, implying that there were several magistrates who contributed to this blog, and he carried on writing it. Angela, um, uh, do you, we, I've asked you really whether you have any, any problem with this. Any, anything briefly you want to respond before I come on to very current um, um, uh, uh, um, matters? I mean, um, everybody has said that it's right that uh, SB should be doing this. And, and, well, and I, know, I know it's quite boring to agree with everyone on the panel, mm. but uh, th this book is really telling it as it is. It, it's not dressing it up, and so I, I have nothing to change in what I originally said. Okay, Angela, as you're here, um, and I don't want to um, hijack the discussion about this book to what is happening at the moment, but I think people will want to hear from you about... Um, here it is, Bar Action Turns Up the Heat on MOJ. That's the headline in a very fine uh, magazine that I happen to contribute to. Um, and um, it says, Direct action by criminal barristers in protest against legal aid reforms has begun to bite after a defendant in a murder trial was left without representation. Um, criminal barristers are refusing new defence work over reforms of the Advocates' Graduated Fee Scheme, AGFS. Um, the defendant in last week's case appeared for his first court hearing at the Old Bailey over the death of his wife. Um, the defendant's solicitor um, said she contacted more than 20 chambers to find a barrister, but none was prepared to take on the case. Now, Jonathan Black, it was your firm that was representing that solicitor, uh, that, 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 whose, whose solicitor was, was involved, <laughs> that, 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 that defendant, um, and, and, and your firm was their, their solicitor. But bef before I come over on to you, um, Andrew, just, just tell us, for those who are not barristers and don't really know what Advocates Graduated Fee Scheme is, um, tell us why this matters so much, um, and tell us what um, action um, that the Criminal Bar Association, which you chair, has recommended, and tell us why. Well, briefly, the A 
AGFS is the system by which criminal barristers get paid and criminal solicitors who work in the Crown Court. The legal aid system has suffered 40% cuts over 10 years, and in fact the Ministry of Justice budget has been cut by that amount as well over 10 years. And those cuts are starting to really penetrate across all aspects of the justice system, from witnesses, from victims to defendants, and the criminal bar has had enough. We are a vocational profession. People don't come to the criminal law, either as barristers or as solicitors, to make a lot of money. And in fact, we are losing lots of our members who are starting out working for very minimal sums of money, working hours and hours and hours for no money at all. The case that hit the headlines in relation to the disclosure problem, that barrister worked for free and her solicitor, I think, as well, overnight, looking at about 5,000 pages of evidence, and we'll see not a penny for it. So we are taking this action, not lightly, but we are taking it because we have had enough, and we think that the justice system has had enough of cuts. Uh, and the, and the action, and the action be, is, yeah. the action is quite harmful to us, in fact. We are not taking on new cases under the new scheme, for the reasons I've said. Um, we won't be paid and therefore there will be no publicly funded barrister to take cases uh, in relation to the new scheme. The MOJ is quoted, the Ministry of Justice is quoted in this uh, article in the Law Society Gazette yesterday saying, we greatly value the work of criminal advocates and will continue to engage with the bar over their concerns regarding the AGFS scheme. Our reforms replace an archaic scheme under which barristers build by pages of evidence. Uh, murder is one of the many categories of cases which will see an uplift in fees under the new scheme. What's your response to that? Well, there isn't anyone from the Ministry of Justice here, and, and they should really be answering that question. But it's not valuing criminal advocacy by cutting fees by 40%, and picking out those cases that may pay the most at the top of the tree, which would have people like me, QCs, undertaking them, is cherry-picking. No member of the bar will take a new case, whether it's paid more under the new scheme or paid less, because the scheme itself contains not, not a penny of investment. The Ministry of Justice took a small envelope of money and moved it around uh, to create this new scheme. It was always envisaged by the members of the bar who negotiated with them that there would be more investment, that some of these cuts would be reversed. That hasn't happened doesn't look as if it's going to happen. It affects both sides of the profession, but as I've said, the bar has had enough in the Ministry of Justice. If it does value criminal justice generally, and advocacy in particular, um, it should do something to restore the situation. Okay, um, Jonathan Black, I know you don't want to talk about your firm BSB solicitors or this particular client, but more generally, um, what's going to be the consequence of this action in the next few weeks if it carries on and maybe even in the long term? Well, it's going to take uh, quite, other than the murder cases which are before the court uh, within days of charge before the Crown Court, it's going to take some weeks for these cases to filter through to the Crown Courts at a crucial stage of plea and trial preparation hearing, which is where the pleas are entered and the timetable is set. Uh, if this isn't settled before then, then we're going to see court lists, judges sitting in empty courts, uh, essentially engaging with prosecutors and perhaps the odd representative from the Public Defender's Service uh, stepping in when and where they can. Okay, Nazir Afsal, that's going to be very difficult for prosecutors. Um, yeah, prosecutors, I mean, when I was chief in the North West, I had to reduce my budget by 30% in three years. I had to let go of 200 lawyers uh, and uh, short-sightedly I let go of my most experienced staff because they were my most expensive staff and, and some of the consequences that you're experiencing now are down to the uh, resources that we had to reduce back then. I'm very much in favour of uh, the bar's action uh, as it currently is. Uh, my concern is um, the Law Society Gazette is not really the me mechanism by which you're going to get tens of thousands of members of the public uh, agonizing with you and just quoting my son, uh, wigs and gowns outside a court uh, with demonstration, um, that's shit, he said. Uh, and, um, you know, the reality is that, you know, the way we've been able to protect the NHS is the users, the patients speak up. And we should 
encourage and uh, support victims, witnesses, the users of our service uh, to speak up in support of all the fact, the fact that you know, it is going to dis be decimated if we continue in this current vein. Well, Penelope, you speak to users of the system. It sounds as if Nazir is saying that users of the system, by which I mean defendants, are going to have to suffer uh, by being unrepresented, at least at the beginning um, of this action, or maybe the, the beginning of the legal process. Um, at least they're not going to be represented by barristers, or perhaps not by the most, the, the most appropriate barristers for their case. Is it right, and I'll give Angela a chance to respond to what I may mean, be a leading I, or misleading question, is it right that they should be in this position? I think the action is totally right. Somebody at some point has to down tools and say that the system is crumbling and can't work. And I trust that judges will adjourn cases rather than getting unrepresented defendants to struggle to represent themselves. That would be the right thing to do. And by adjourning cases, it will create chaos in the system. I would say on legal aid that it goes beyond, um, I mean, it, it affects solicitors, barristers, and it is a real problem that their fees have been cut and the amount, but also it affects defendants. So we've got an increasing number of unrepresented defendants anyway in the magistrate's courts because what they've done with legal aid is that they have frozen the threshold by which you can uh, get legal aid. So that means that more and more people who are not rich, can I just say, middle-income people in the magistrate's courts can't get a le you know, do not meet the threshold for legal aid and can't afford to have a lawyer. And so that is creating chaos in the courts itself. It's a false economy. So we need more legal aid to go both to lawyers themselves, but also for the threshold to be different. I mean, somebody said to me, actually, in government, it wouldn't cost very much not to have an income threshold for legal aid in the magistrate's courts. So okay. we're talking small sums of money here. Okay. Angela, um, last word, I think, uh, on this subject, and then we'll see what SB has to say on this, on this subject. But, but um, I know you don't describe this as a strike. This is your members choosing voluntarily not to take on new cases. But whenever there is what we can describe as a strike, the leaders of that profession, organization, company, uh, trade, say, you know, our argument is not with the public. We're very sorry that the public have to suffer delays in trains or lack of support in whatever industry it is. Um, but, you know, we need to do this in order to, um, to, to get through to the government, the employers, and so on. Is it different with justice because you know you are denying people effective representation you're denying them access to the courts you are potentially denying them justice well the ministry of justice could resolve this very easily for relatively small sums of money uh, and no system can withstand this level of cut over a decade no system could and we see the consequences every day for the members of the public. A young man could have gone to prison for 15 years just before Christmas if his barrister hadn't worked on his case for free. This affects everyone very directly. And we believe that if we don't take this action, and we believe that it will become wider, then the justice system will never recover. And the break that we are experiencing will become a shattered okay. system. And I think the Lord Chancellor just very recently described it when he said he was going to stay on after a certain case, that he wants to stay on to fix the shattered system. I, I, I thought that was quite an optimistic okay. thing to hear. And right. I hope he means it. Let's see what SB has to say. Can we scroll on and, and see the, um, some more comments from SB um, in the last few minutes, um, if there are any, um, to... Uh, um, uh, to see whether SB's commented uh, more recently than um, 11 minutes ago. Um, Nazir, did you want to add something to what uh, Angela was saying? Um, absolutely. Um, uh, amongst, uh, when we have the incidents just before Christmas and just after around disclosure, 
they come down to the fact that it doesn't just start with the prosecution team. Uh, you know, I was Chief Executive of the Police and Crime Commissioners uh, for a year and a bit, and I can tell you that policing has had the same impact. Um, we've lost experienced officers. Uh, there are fewer officers carrying out supervision. It's often seen as a uh, tick box exercise. Uh, there's a substantial amount of tunnel vision. They focus on the suspect and that's it. Uh, and uh, so the issues that um, start there but they go all the way through the system. And of course, the police would turn around and say, yes, we've had a massive reduction in our budgets. Uh, court service would exactly say the same thing. So um, Andrew was absolutely right. At some point, you've got to draw the line and say enough is enough. My, my issue isn't uh, with the fact that that's, that's what we should be doing, because we should. It's how. Uh, because I, I'm, my, I'm, I'm really, I think it's the, being in the real world, we will not get people speaking up on behalf of lawyers. There won't be buses going around saying no. They, all the election time, they always say more teachers, more, uh, yeah, more nurses. They never say more lawyers, do they? And, <laughs> and, and so we, we've got, in order to engage our public, um, we've got to stop using language like uh, AGFS uh, and talk to them about human rights and talk to them about uh, representation, and talk to them about miscarriage of justice. And, and actually, people who are the victims of all of those things should be leading this debate. Uh, and I think that's something that um, may ultimately uh, change the government's mind. But at the end, the point, the point is, at the moment, uh, I don't see that happening the way it's been. Angela, yeah. Like lots of the victims are voiceless. Children, people most vulnerable in society. Uh, if we don't speak up for them, who is going to? No, I th I, lawyers have to in those circumstances, but there are tens of thousands of people who've been through the system or use the system who aren't voiceless. And sadly, I don't hear many of them speaking up. Angela, tell us about the sli slightly unusual crowd-funded direct action to influence members of parliament. Well, we are very keen to do what's being suggested and make this issue one uh, that is highlighted in the public domain. So we have sent, or will be sending when parliament resumes, the book of the secret barrister to every <laughs> member of parliament so that it can't be said that those who govern us haven't been told what the system is like. And I should say that the secret barrister is donating all of the profits to the bar pro bono unit as well. And so we are taking steps to try to make this a public debate, which it should be. And SB says on the question of the legal aid action, I echo Angela Rafferty and the rest of the panel entirely. We're not talking about huge sums of money. Government manages to find money for the things it cares about. We need to make it care. Um, uh, uh, Penelope, you, you were a, um, a lay magistrate um, and you don't necessarily agree with everything that SB says about magistrates. Tell us first of all what SB says and then tell us why you disagree. Um, I mean, SB calls the magistrates courts the Wild West and um, uh, I would recommend anybody read that chapter. I mean, where I totally agree with her is that, at its worst, what happens in the magistrates' courts, which is most criminal cases, is conveyor belt justice. It's done too quickly, with too little preparation, and so on. SB does seem to say that she thinks that the lay magistrate has really no role because they are useless. This is her saying it, they're useless, I used to be one. Um, I think some of her criticisms are spot on. I think their training is not sufficient. They should be recruited in a more modern way. So if you look at a lay bench, we're not talking about people who are representative of the people, as it were, because they're usually white and old. Uh, and, but what I would say is there are some absolutely fantastic magistrates out there, some of them in this room, and we should build on that. We should work out who are the good ones, why are they good. We should go out there to seek new, younger magistrates and to train them better. And I think with training, we could turn it around. But a lot of the problems she talks about at the magistrates court are nothing to do with the magistrates anyway. It's to do with a lack of resources. So there's a terrifying anecdote in here about her prosecuting as what's called an agent, where you're hired like the evening before and she describes going into court with files for something like five or six trials as a prosecution agent and literally winging it so having no time 
to read through that file, maybe 10 minutes each. And when we're talking about people's livelihoods here and the prospect of them getting criminal records, this is terrifying. So she does these six cases with 10 minutes each and she describes how people are not allowed to, the pressure not to adjourn cases, um, which means, and I picked this up on Twitter as well, that there was a case which actually in the end went to appeal where the prosecution said, I'm really sorry, uh, can we adjourn this case? Because uh, the witness has just heard that most of the members of her family have died in a car crash in, I think it was, Pakistan, and therefore she can't make court today. In that case, it was actually a district judge who said, no, sorry, that's not a good enough excuse, and actually refused to adjourn that hearing and that was in fact appealed up. But that is a flavor of the pressures that the magistrate's court is under. And I know I've been criticized on Twitter for saying it, but it does end up too often being conveyor belt justice. Okay, um, I should explain for the benefit of this discussion that uh, as you all have gathered, SP is gender fluid. The, um, the, the, con <laughs> the, um, the conceit of this book is you don't know what gender know, SP no. is. Um, and you shouldn't read anything into the fact that SP's voice was represented by a male actor um, in, the, um, in the extract that was, was read there. Um, Jonathan, let, let's turn to you. Let, let's talk about the broader issues then that SB um, raises. I mean, to some extent, you and SB are in a similar position. Um, you're both advocates. You're both uh, dealing with clients on a daily basis. You both have an overview of the system, from, uh, but from a slightly different perspective. Um, you, you, you would say, would you, that SB has got it right? I think it's spot on. I think, I think every chapter, and I'm now not the only lawyer around who is nodding as they turn every page and think, well, in fact, it's a little bit boring. I'm sorry, Aspie, it's a little bit boring because we, as lawyers reading this, we know, what, we, we know all this anyway. And you're actually, what, what, you're, what you've written resonates with 90%, 95% of the profession. However, the book is fantastic because it needs to be on the reading list of every law student, everyone contemplating study, studying law, in addition, of course, to the members of parliament. But what he does is he demonstrates the result, demonstrates the broken justice system, which can't just be fixed by you know, tinkering here, tinkering there, fixing the hull of the ship, fixing, adding sails to the sinking ship. You've got to fix the hull, fix the engine before you make the ship go faster with uh, shiny new sails. But this is all really a result of successive governments with their populist rhetoric, uh, which, also, which collide, introducing legislation after legislation after legislation, uh, retrograde legislation, uh, which collides essentially with what we see today being the austerity-driven uh, culture uh, obsession of the current government, which is... Uh, <laughs> obsessed with outsourcing and speedy justice as well as the secret barrister says stacking it high selling it cheap and that's what they want us to do as legal professionals they want us to follow suit with what they say in fact it, the chief executive of uh, her majesty's court service was congratulating herself last night on twitter for the uh, big word contract that's the interpreters contract um, having a 98 percent success rate not 100% sex, uh, success rate, 98% success rate was fantastic as far as they're concerned. The rest of us have to work by key performance indicators which have to be over 100% most of the time. But the point is that they're congratulating themselves on these contracts, they're congratulating themselves on the success of these contracts, and I can go on longer about the interpreters, but I know there's other people to speak. Uh, and, and you get the impression that this clearly is a template that the Ministry of Justice would like to develop uh, following from the prisons and the interpreters right through to the legal professionals. Okay, quick right of reply from uh, SB. Um, I don't say magistrates are useless. No doubt there are excellent magistrates, but not enough, and there's not enough training. Uh, and SB agrees with Penelope. 
Uh, the pressures of the magistrate's court lead to conveyor belt justice. Too much is done too quickly, too cheaply. Right, um, time for questions from the audience. I see a number of distinguished lawyers in the audience, and I see a number of people who are um, uh, blessed with not being lawyers. Um, and um, I, we have a roving mic. Um, can I see how many people want to ask questions um, of the panel and of SB? Um, what I don't want you to do is tell me your misfortunes, your court case, your stories. I do want to ask, I do want to take specific questions, but, but let's see. Um, uh, there's a, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lady there. Um, uh, we'll get the microphone um, to you and, 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 and then, we'll, then we'll, we'll go to Angela's predecessor. <laughs> Uh, yeah. My name is Vanika Kingsland. I'd like to know how TSB protects his IP or her IP without someone else claiming copyright. How, how does, how does SB, how, well this is a question for you SB, how do you p protect your intellectual property um, without somebody else claiming copyright? I mean the book does say um, in the front here, um, copyright secret barrier. Copyright the secret barriers for 2018. But I know, as all the copyright lawyers will know, I don't think that means a great deal. Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave SB to reply to that. I'll take another question um, now. Um, um, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Um, yes, Francis. Yes, I'm Francis Fitzgibbon. I'm a criminal barrister. I've been in practice a bit longer than SB, I think 32 years now. Um, I'm not SB, but in a sense, all criminal lawyers are SB, in the sense that all Roman slaves are Spartacus, because his book really is the story of my professional life, certainly for the last few years. But my, my question for him or her, sorry, for the lack of gender fluidity, my, my question is this, whether USB think that the senior judiciary should have done more and should be doing more to stand up for the fundamental values that you and most of us think are severely under threat? I mean, that's, that's a very interesting question. Should the judges do more? Um, I mean, the judges perhaps feel that they're trying to keep everything together and try and um, you know, keep the show on the road and trying to make up for the failings of the advocates in certain cases, perhaps. Um, uh, Angela, do you, do you want to pick that particular question up? Um, should the judges, should the judges, um, you know, and you know the judges, um, and you appear before them? Um, I, I don't know if you sit, but 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 um, if you don't, you probably soon will. And um, you know, should the judges simply say, right, I'm going to adjourn this case and and send the bill to the Ministry of Justice, or should they try to keep the show on the road as much as they possibly can? Well, I do sit as a judge, and, and I know it probably won't find a lot of favour here, but I do have some sympathy with the judiciary because they are independent. It is very difficult for them to speak out. But I do think that many of them, in their own personal views, will know that the time to worry is right now because so many people across the system are agreeing with each other. To have a bunch of lawyers in the same room all agreeing and not arguing with each other <laughs> is a sign that things are very, very bad indeed. And I think the judiciary are, are and must be aware of it. What they do about it is, of course, entirely a matter for their own individual judgment. But they do <coughs> presumably have conversations with those in power and they are able to take things up with them, and I hope that that is happening, but it's very difficult for them to take up a public position. Okay, in answer to your question there, you can see the answer on the screen. How do I protect my intellectual property? Answer, please don't give anyone any ideas. Um, okay, another question from the audience, um, please. Gentleman at the back in the red shirt, just next to the microphone. You, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Ember Solomon. I'm the chief executive of a charity called uh, Just for Kids Law. Um, so, so my question is about how do we turn uh, a negative into a positive? So it's easy to criticize a system that's uh, broken because of resources, uh, and my organization has every sympathy and supports that argument. But how can we turn this into an opportunity to think about a justice system that works in the interests of those who it hasn't been working well for for many years? And obviously, from our experience, it's about children and young people, uh, and we've, we have seen through our work and campaign for the criminal justice system and the courts to, to do a much better job 
particularly representing those disadvantaged uh, children and people, and, and indeed around the use of stop and search and all those issues. So how can we turn this into a positive right. about reframing it for, a, for an agenda for change? Um, I, I think that's a, a very important question. I will ask all of you this question. Um, um, uh, um, Penelope, I cut you off. You were going to say something about the, the judges, but, but can you briefly answer the question about what the judges should do and then answer Enver's question about um, how we turn this crisis into an opportunity? Um. I mean, I think it is very difficult for the judges, and one of the things I think is difficult is that due to the, when the position of Lord Chief Justice and Lord Chancellor was split, the judges became completely enmeshed in the uh, running of the court service. So they are on the board of the court service. So I'm afraid when we have crumbling court buildings, and people who get absurd searches, lawyers are getting their wallet searched when they go into courts. Inevitably, the judges are part of the running of that organization. They, are, they have to answer for it too. So I have to say in the medium term and long term, I think they need to extricate themselves from actually being part of court policy in order to retain their independence. Okay, I mean what SB says is I would hope that strong representations are being made to the Minister of Justice and the Lord Chancellor behind closed doors. I, I mean that, I, I, I'm sure I, I hope we all hope that as well, but I, I suppose that may be demanding a bit much of the judges given their independence um, and the fact that they've got to work with the Ministry of Justice um, uh, by statute, um, and, and, and uh, I, I can see the problems. Nazir, I mean, you've, you've had to work within the system. Yeah. You understand the difficulties of cuts, as you've told us. Um, uh, again, should the judges be uh, um, uh, protesting firmly to ministers, or is it better to try and work with ministers and show ministers a way out of this problem uh, uh, yeah, more efficiently? If, if there is one, yeah, absolutely, uh, they should. The judges, we, we all, if there's a case that goes belly up, we know the judges will have a, something to say about that in, particular, in a particular case. But you know how that becomes, that becomes framed as an attack on the police or the prosecution or parole board, whatever it is. It becomes an attack on the institution rather than what the cause was, i.e. the fact they don't have enough resources. So, um, you know, I've, I've sat with um, uh, senior judges uh, at meetings at the MOJ and uh, other departments, and um, they do skirt around, skirt around the issue, I think. Uh, but there are, I, I suspect, I, you know, you will know better than I, hundreds of retired judges. There's nothing stopping them speaking up and saying what they think of the system, because I, I think there is this issue. I, very recently, I had a... Um, concern about the DPP and what she had been saying. If you remember a few weeks ago, she said that nobody's in prison um, uh, as a result of a miscarriage of justice. And within 30 minutes, I was saying the exact opposite because you, know, you can't say that. And uh, you, you, competence is what delivers confidence. Uh, and if you don't, for whatever reason, you're not saying the whole truth, people are just not gonna believe anything you say. But, but she, she, she has the distinction of being the first Director of Public Prosecutions to have worked her way up through the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, she understands perhaps better than a barrister who might replace her from outside the system, um, or solicitor, um, what it's like being on the ground as a prosecutor. I infer from that response that she feels the need to try to uphold morale, but you would say she's it's going about it in the wrong it way. Works, it works exactly the opposite way. I'm, I've known Alison for more than 20 years, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for her. I've worked with her, sat next to her, worked on cases with her. And um, the only people that ever ring me up from the CPS, or, and I mean dozens of people every month, are people complaining. Uh, and so uh, you will know better than I, they have an annual staff survey. I don't know what the current data suggests, but morale is very poor, and it's, true, it's poor across all uh, justice agencies, not just the Crown Prosecution Service. But what I think the staff would want, uh, and I think that police officers would want on behalf of their leadership, et cetera, et cetera, is tell the truth. Tell, you know, we would rather you say, when the disclosure issues arose and continue to arise, we can't do it with our current capacity. We can't do it with our current capability. We can't do it with a lack of supervision, the lack of experience. We can't do it in our current budget. That, I think, will be much more 
Um, certainly, you'll, you'll get all your staff behind you, so you've got 5,000 more ambassadors speaking up, uh, whether it's on Twitter secretly or otherwise. Um, but you've also got people from the members of the public thinking, at the moment they have this issue with lawyers, I mean, I've been a lawyer 25, 27, 20 years, they have this issue of them and us. We're different to the public. We use a different language. Uh, and, you know, diversity, welcome to diversity. We're, we're very diverse in this room, as we are in the magistracy profession, as we are anywhere else for that matter. You know, but the public want us to say things that they feel. And at the moment, we don't do that. And it's because we're, we're trapped in civil service code land or um, trapped in uh, just the way our contracts are drawn up. I don't believe any of that, to be frank. I think that the public would welcome the DPP or a chief constable or, or, a, or a judge for that matter saying it is intolerable that this person is in this court for the reasons that this person is in court and this case cannot proceed. It, they would welcome that. And, and, and it's okay as far as you're concerned, is there, for the DPP or somebody else who's head of a semi-independent body, a parole board for example, to say publicly that we can't carry on with the money you, the government, are giving us because you've cut our money and our service will deteriorate and it's down to you and that person who's head of that public service should be campaigning vigorously, in your view, to persuade ministers to pay that particular service more? I said that recently and Charlie Faulkner, the former Lord Chancellor, agreed, agreed and said yes, they should say more and they're allowed to say more. Um, the reality, of course, is that people don't do that. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the worst person to speak about this subject because I walked out of my last job because they wouldn't let me speak up. So I think the reality that, that was is, a crime commissioner. That's chief executive of the police and crime commissioner. So my point is that if you feel really important, this is really important to say that your job shouldn't be that important, to be frank. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are here to represent the public that we serve. Okay, and Jonathan Black, um, Ember's question, how can we turn this into an opportunity? SB has described eloquently what the problem is. Um, how do we draw on this and how do we move forward and how do we fix it? And, and given, given the very genuine constraints um, in public finances, it may be slightly better than it was in 2008, but you know, everybody's taking a cut. Uh, why should the lawyers be any different? You know, the judges are taking cuts. Everybody in the public service is taking cuts. So, you know, there isn't the magic money tree. Um, how, do we, how do we take advantage of this analysis of the problem and, and try and solve it? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I'm, I'm pleased to be answering this question. Or pleased this question was asked by um, the Chief Executive of Just for Kids Law, who have been doing some fantastic work over the years. And uh, please do look them up and look at the work they've been doing. And I'm well aware of their work. And that's uh, a little plug there. Um, I moves on to another plug, and that is the Charter for Justice was an initiative which we launched about uh, two or three weeks ago in conjunction with Penny was involved in this, as was Angela and other stakeholders, I'm not going to use the word stakeholders, other, others with interests within the uh, criminal justice system. And, and the idea was to put together a set of minimum requirements that we need for a working, solid, working criminal justice system. We've got to move away from this obsession that the Ministry of Justice have had with management consultants paying £30 million to PwC to sort out, to close the courts or to introduce night courts. And they've got to stop having these engagement groups, symposiums, stakeholders meetings and whatever. Blue sky thinking is one which keeps coming up and I look, at, look above me and cringe. And, and, and we've, got to, we've got to move forward and whilst they'll say we like to engage with the, with the stakeholders and the professions, it's only a small few that get involved in these meetings, get involved in this engagement, and they're not listened to at all. And taking the profession and asking the profession to draw up a criminal justice system that works, not necessarily financially, so that we fill our wallets and our bank accounts with lots of money from the non-existence legal aid fund, but in fact to make it more efficient so that, we, so that our working life is easier, so that we can provide proper access to justice for our clients, so that the, our clients feel like they are stakeholders in the system and come to court and feel they're not being treated and shunted down corridors and shunted to other courts. We know exactly how it works. We know exactly what is needed. We know exactly what reforms are needed. And you can start with reintroducing committal proceedings, for example, which were abolished 10 years ago. 
Really? Yeah, these we, were. The, this, this, this is for the benefit of non lawyers here. This is where you had hearings in magistrates' courts before cases were sent to the Crown Court for trial. Um, and the evidence was uh, in the past, and an old style committal was heard by the magistrates and written down and then sent off, and, and that all seemed a terrible waste of time. Well, it wasn't a, it wasn't a waste of time, because what we could see now is that it was, in fact, a check and a balance. A case would come to court in the magistrate's court, and the papers would have to be served in the magistrate's court, and if it wasn't served in the magistrate's court, the, prosecution, the prosecutor was there to explain why they weren't, why it wasn't served. A defendant in custody would be released if the papers weren't served. The other week, I had a client in custody for six months, and on the day of the trial, the prosecutor said, oh, we'll drop the ABH and the GBH and take a plea to harassment. The other week, I had a client in custody for four months for a rape. Three days before the trial, the prosecution reviews and it decides to drop it. It's only through committal proceedings that they can actually review these cases. And, and the magistrates, and this is where the magistrates, magist, magistrates come into play, can act as a check weight and check, a check and balance in relation to these cases. But just to add one other issue in relation to this, we talk about the tax on innocence. Well, many of these people that have suffered the tax on innocence, and the tax on innocence is referred to by the secret barrister in relation to those who don't have the benefit of legal aid, who are then acquitted and then have to and, and, and receive very little remuneration back. Well, with committal proceedings, as that check those that are having to go through the, pro the court process can at least have a review of their case before it gets to the Crown Court, because a number of these people that are required to pay tens of thousands of pounds Crown Court fees find themselves only on the day of the trial having their case reviewed, having the case dropped, and they're saying, well, what about my cost? Sorry, it's only about 200 pounds. That's a legal aid rate for that. And so there are so many reasons why I feel the reintroduction right. of that level would work. Uh, Angela, let's deal with that specific point, bring back this filtering system that the magistrates used to perform. Um, I don't know how effectively, but certainly it, it, it forced the prosecution's hand. Uh, and then the broader question of how we take advantage of this analysis of the situation and, 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 and look for opportunities to improve it. Well, I, I'm afraid I don't agree with John about the committal proceedings, so that's my answer. But I think because, because? I, th I think it just takes too long. I, I think it is an efficiency that works well. I think we need to answer this question, which is a great question, on a wider scale. I think that if we all think about before 1949, if you didn't have the money and you were accused of a serious crime or any crime, you usually didn't have a representative. In 1949, legal aid became a pillar of democracy, and many, many people's lives were saved, and many people's years of their lives were saved through trials. So I think we need to start this process of fixing this by putting justice back where it belongs, which is as a pillar of our democracy, and for that we need public education. We have citizenship taught in school since 2002, but from the young people that come, and I represent them, the, the level of their knowledge of what actually crime is about, the principles of criminal liability, are very, very, very misunderstood. Consent is not taught in schools, yet 40% of the work in criminal courts is sexual offending. There's a lot of things we can do to bring the principles of criminal liability and justice to the young people in schools. There is a public legal education panel set up by a Solicitor General, I think, last year. That needs to be both publicised and have the public take part in it and I, and I think we need to recognise and everyone and this is bigger than one person everyone in the system needs to recognise that there is a crisis once that's recognised then we can move on to answer the question that's been asked and interestingly I mean SB is, is agreeing with you um, and, and has said very similar things to what you said um, um, as you're saying them in fact um, ignite public interest, um, possibly even affection in criminal justice. The more non-lawyers I talk to, the more astonishment there is at the way things are. If people knew the truth about the way justice works, I genuinely believe they will support the arguments that we are making. We've got time for a few more questions, um, a round of questions. Yes, over there and then over there. So, um, Mike, Mike Napier. Uh, Mike Napier, uh, retired solicitor, uh, sometime magistrate's court advocate back in the day. Um, hats off to you, Angela, and the Criminal Bar Association for the action you're taking. I'd like to know 
uh, Jonathan, whether the solicitors are thinking of joining in this time. They've uh, taken industrial action in the past. That's one question to you. But to the whole panel, um, I hesitate to use the word momentum, but in a different context. <laughs> um, it, it's, it seems to me that with the, the help of SB and the problems about disclosure, that there the, the might be the, the, the first shoots of public opinion moving in the direction of what this panel session is all about. Um, for at least 20 years there have been sessions like this and frankly they haven't really got anywhere. But if public opinion and the newspapers could get behind what is now being said, there would be a chance, I suggest, of bypassing the Ministry of Justice that will always play a straight bat and not give an answer that, that will give any money. Okay. You have to go to the Treasury. Why do you go to the Treasury and really try and affect, try and, in, in, try and influence politicians who've actually got a say? It's where the purse strings are held that it matters. Thank you. A gentleman over there. Yeah, my name is George Kies. I'm a member of the public. Um, I welcome the secret barrister going into journalism and whistleblowing, but I would prefer the profession to do a private prosecution through one politician for paltering which is to tell the truth, only the truth, but not all the truth. So okay, you, you, you politicians of perjury. Gentlemen over there, yeah. Uh, hang on, the microphone will come to you. I'm making it difficult for the microphones by whizzing around the room, but um, um, we'll, we'll get to you. There it is, go ahead. My name's Ian Alston. I'm chairman of the Edmund Burke Society, and I'm just <coughs> um, answering your question or trying to apply Burke to what you said about... Um, we're all in it together, so we should take cuts, the, the, the judges and uh, the CPS might say, and so therefore it's fair that others take cuts as well, that it goes right across the system. But Burke would say that power uh, must not be arbitrary, it must always be used on behalf of the people. And so I think it would be totally appropriate for judges and CPS and people to take cuts, but not inflict that on the people who are the ultimate users. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's enough questions. Um, let's start um, with Michael Napier, um, Michael Napier QC, his question. Um, um, will solicitors join in? Jonathan, what, what, what's your answer to, um, to, to, to that? Well, I, I don't speak as a head of any association, so I'm, I'm, I'm relatively free to say what I like in respect to that. I'm not going to say what I like because I don't want to create another Twitter storm in relation to um, whether you know, the solicitors are backing out or going into, into war with the MOJ. What I think there should be, I think there should be action. I think, I think it's about, well, the time well passed for full action. The, um, the, there is obviously the judicial review over the uh, litigator fee over the legal aid cut, which was introduced in November. Um, that there is, unfortunately, what's happening, Michael, to be quite honest with you, is solicitors are just being ground into the, you know, ground into the, into the floor by the Ministry of Justice, by the Legal Aid Agency, by cut after cut after cut, by regulation after regulation after regulation, monitoring this, monitoring that, refusing payments on this, refusing payments on that. And unfortunately, Instead of the good old-fashioned, we are angry, let's rise up, it's uh, very much a feeling of we're just fed up and we just need to get on. Um, I'm hoping that the mood of the profession is such that, someone will, that you know, there will be sufficient momentum, to coin your phrase and someone else's phrase, uh, and to follow the bar and to work with the bar and to continue until we get around the table with the Ministry of Justice and say that these structures are ridiculous. Yeah. Um, we cannot provide access to justice on the current rates and the current structures. Joe Egan, who's president of the Law Society, is quoted in the Gazette as saying that the bar's action shines a light on wider concerns shared by lawyers that criminal legal aid services and justice itself are under threat. The same concern has led us to issue judicial review proceedings against cuts to fees for Crown Court work. Um, and as you say, there's the Charter um, for Justice that you mentioned. Um, with the, this is the uh, London Criminal Court Solicitors Association with the support of the Criminal Law Solicitors Association and the CBA. Um, what about this, this broader question of whether public opinion is changing? Penelope, I mean, you're, you, you're, you're aware of, 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 you're a campaigner. You, 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 uh, there are times when it's easier to campaign, times 
when it's harder to campaign. Do you think that this is actually getting through to people? Um, there is a phrase um, um, which I won't even utter today, but, but if, I, if I mention feline um, and uh, rotund, you might get the, 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 the general um, gist. But, I mean, do, do, are people beginning to understand that, that, that that's not the case? I mean, I, I think it's very hard to say. In general, people are not very interested in the intricacies of the criminal justice system, nor, dare I say it, what lawyers are paid. So I think that um, what was right by Mike Napier was that disclosure gives us a window that those stories, which were actually in the tabloids as well as the mainstream newspapers about people being subject to these mass miscarriages of justice, no, they didn't get imprisoned, but it was still a miscarriage of justice that they got that far. I think that really did lift a lid, and actually across the board, there was a very sympathetic tone in the media about that issue. I think we need to find more issues like that. I'm not sure if we can keep going on disclosure as, as I mean, we can still try, but we need more issues which demonstrate why the money matters, that actually it affects the justice of real people who are maybe sitting in prison when they shouldn't have done. I mean, one issue which is quite undercovered is the pressure to plead guilty. But there is huge pressure, particularly in magistrates' courts, um, for people to plead guilty when, frankly, they may have a perfectly reasonable defense. Now, that is a miscarriage of justice which gets no coverage. And I think if people understood what was happening there, again, you would get that public sympathy. So I think the top line needs to be the effect on actual justice for, for witnesses as well as uh, for defendants. And then underneath that, you can talk about the fees. OK, Nazir Afzal, last word from you. Um, disappointingly, there isn't the momentum. I've been in Brixton, Bristol, Manchester, and Birmingham in the last four days with hundreds of people, and not one of them mentioned this issue. I think Penelope's right, and I think Angela's right. The way to do this is public education. We, we often do schools thing and we do a mute, mooting competition. Well, that's not good enough in my view. We should be talking about human rights amongst young people and get them to understand this is about human rights. Uh, but also, what, how do we get people to come on board? It goes back to what I said earlier on, that we speaking about it is only going to get us that far. But if there are the, the victims or the people who are suffering as a result of all these, uh, these cutbacks and all the issues that we've, we've touched on this evening, if they were our, amb our ambassadors and they were given the oxygen of publicity, then it would have a difference. Okay, Angela Rafferty, last well, word from you. If, you were, if any of you were on a jury and you had somebody like me standing in front of you with a wig on and there was an issue of disclosure in the case and I was suggesting to you that you couldn't be sure and otherwise the case was strong, but you couldn't be sure because 5,000 pages hadn't been looked at. You may have a pause in your mind as you considered that case. So this cuts both ways. Innocent people could be going to prison for things they didn't do, but also the general faith that everyone has in the jury system can be eroded because juries aren't sure that the evidence has been looked at properly. So I think there is a very big public interest in this. I'm not sure that we will ever get the press on board. The rotund felines is something we're well used to. And with, my members are not like that. They're young, they're striving, they're, they're vocational, they're leaving to go to better paid jobs. But I think the question about power is very interesting. I was listening to the ex Lord Chief Justice on Radio 4's Today programme talking about the dangers of secondary legislation after Brexit. Uh, and I think that the justice system when we're going into this unprecedented change in our culture, should be in as good shape as possible across the board, and it simply isn't. And we should all be terrified about that, because if the executive has too much power or if the criminal justice system isn't working, as, as it clearly isn't, then that is just going to get worse and worse and worse in the tribulations ahead that we've got. So I think it is of massive public interest, and people should go out from here tonight and spread the word. OK, and a last word from SB. He or she says that operating in a Twitter bu bubble, it's difficult to say with confidence but, uh, whether public opinion is turning, but this is definitely an opportunity to turn the spotlight onto justice. Uh, stories of miscarriages of justice are being reported in relation to disclosure uh, in a way we haven't seen before. Uh, and if there isn't momentum, well, at least there's an opportunity for it. Now, at this stage, I would normally say that 
SB will be signing copies of uh, the book outside if they haven't all been sold uh, by the, uh, the booksellers outside. I can see some of you have bought copies already. Um, you may see a ghostly hand coming out of the Twitter sphere and scribbling something, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, but do buy the book. Um, it really is very good indeed. Um, and all that remains now is for me to thank uh, Penelope Gibbs, Jonathan Black, Angela Rafferty, Nazir Afsal. Thank you all very much indeed.